for the welcome, and uh, I apologize for not knowing as much as I should have earlier this morning about Norwegian Air Shuttle, but, um, you know, the, the, the first question is, are you, uh, and is it possible in Norway, to be a low-cost airline? Well, I think, uh, which was already said here, it's all uh, relative, isn't it? Uh, in Scandinavia, its uh, cost level is very high. So, uh, yes, it's uh, definitely possible to be low cost in Scandinavia, but it's all relative to that cost basis. Well, yeah. that's sort of like saying, yes, we are, but actually, brackets, no, we're not. Uh, so absolutely, absolutely. I totally agree with that. <laughs> so, so explain to me then why or how you've challenged the orthodoxy of, of airline operation in Scandinavia. What have you done differently from SAS and the others that have been before you? Well, I think uh, it's been uh, touched on already uh, quite a lot today. It's, um, the business model we follow is the, the one of the low-cost uh, airlines. It's about high utilization of your aircraft and your crew. Uh, it's about uh, getting cost, being efficient, cost efficient in everything you do. And, uh, a lot of low-cost uh, airlines pursue that, obviously. The uh, challenge we have out of Scandinavia, though, is uh, the cost of level, uh, living is, uh, is fairly high. So, yes, we do, relative to others, you could say, have a cost disadvantage. Uh, but if you do look at uh, cost benchmarking, uh, you will see that already today, with the 80 aircraft fleet flying mostly out of Scandinavia, we have the second best unit cost in, in Europe. So as far as the customer experience, is it, give me, what, if I wanted to fly on your airline from Oslo, what's your most popular route in Spain? We fly most, uh, most routes uh, to, to Spain. It's uh, Malaga, Alicante. Okay, so I, 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 I get online, I want the absolute cheapest deal yep. from Oslo to Malaga. Uh, what am I going to find? You know, in US dollar terms, what are you offering me? Oh, the cheapest, uh, the cheapest fare uh, would be around twenty, twenty-five uh, dollars. Really? Yeah. And how far in advance do I have to book that? Just a couple of years? <laughs> yeah, three, three and a half years. <laughs> no, it's uh, it's like any other airlines. Uh, basically, it's uh, you sell your tickets within a seven, eight months uh, window. It yeah. starts out. Uh, the cheapest and, and increases as uh, you get closer to... to uh, no, of course. I mean, to what extent are you able to compete? I mean, Michael has operations in Scandinavia and EasyJet, I'm sure they do too. Well, not, uh, not really. No? So, I'm sure I've flown Ryanair to Arlanda. Have I made that up? Is that in my imagination? No, it's, uh, that's Sweden, yeah, Scandinavia. So, no, like, uh, yeah, I know. I'm talking about Sweden. Absolutely. But, uh, well, you do Sweden. We do Sweden. We do, uh, do all of it. So, yeah, we do sort of compete with uh, Reiner, uh, but uh, strategically... You said that with great sadness in your voice, like <laughs> you try and compete but don't really succeed, or am I no, misreading no. you? You are misreading. Oh. Uh, point is, uh, uh, we compete with Ryanair into Scandinavia, yeah. Uh, Ryanair flies into secondary airports mm -hmm. that do have a totally different cost structure to it. Uh, we fly primary airports and uh, do incur some higher cost out of that. But uh, our passengers do not incur that taxi bill you have to pay to get into to Oslo, if that's where you're headed. Yeah, no, that's a very fair point. Yeah. Uh, it's a hell of a taxi if you're going from Arlanda to Oslo. But, Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> Even Torp and, uh, and, uh, and Rigge. But the uh, point is, uh, uh, yes, we're competing with Ryanair. They have a great cost basis. Uh, but we are not really competing with them on uh, most of our route network because uh, of the secondary airport. Uh, I understand. And, and in, again, in terms of the vision of what um, the low-cost offer is and what it's going to look like in five and ten years from now, what, what's your vision? I mean, in terms of discussing the, the, the services provided, how you... I've forgotten the word he used. It had lots of syllables in it, but how you into... Me, what was it? Into... Sex, I think. Disintermedi <laughs> dis disintermediate and therefore charge for all of the different services from <coughs> check-in baggage to going and having a pee and everything else. What, what, what is the Norwegian vision? I think uh, two, you'll see two things uh, happening going forward. Uh, the low-cost airlines are going to be the business model represented by the low-cost airlines. It's going to be this industry's uh, business model down, down the road. Uh, it's all about uh, cost. It's all about having the lowest cost basis and so that you can offer a lower fare than your competitor. Uh, I think that's, uh, well, that's a strategy uh, we are pursuing and we're thinking that 
No, I just want some specifics. I mean, yeah. uh, is the Scandinavian or the wider European customer in your airline uh, going to be, I assume they're already paying to check in bags, are they? In uh, the, the model we're pursuing is uh, uh, we want our passengers to have the freedom to choose what services to pay for. Mm -hmm. So if you do want to carry a second luggage on board, a, on board aircraft, uh, you'll pay for it. Uh, the first one is free. If you do want champagne, wine, uh, wine on the, on the uh, uh, traveling, you can pay for that. And uh, we build up the, the product that way. Uh, and, and, and do you think uh, your customers are going to see you as a, as a low-cost budget airline, or are they going to see you as something else? I think they'll see, today they see us definitely as a low-cost airline. Uh, five, ten years from now, I think it's not really uh, going to be about legacy carriers, low-cost uh, airlines. Uh, the industry is going to be a very efficient one, uh, where today's low-cost airlines basically uh, have a majority market share. And it's because you can offer a lower airfare uh, all the time, or the lowest, and you can have your customers pay for the services they want. Now, on top of that. right. Michael, sitting next to you, says he's too poor to uh, buy new planes at the prices and with the time delays that are currently factored in. And yet you seem to have been on the most incredible plane buying spree. Mm -hmm. uh, tell everybody how many you've bought, how much it's costing, and, and then explain how you can pull it off when Michael says he can't. Well, we, we bought uh, a year and a half ago, we ordered 222 new aircraft. Uh, Sorry, how many? 222. 222 new ones? Yes. All in one go? All in one go. And uh, we're uh, obviously not getting all of them at once. No. That's a, that's, that's a, <laughs> it's a hell of a credit card you've got. Yeah. It, it's, uh, well, what did you buy exactly? Well, we got uh, 100 uh, NEOs, 100 Max, uh, Maxes from, from Boeing and uh, additional uh, 22 NGs, which is our current fleet, uh, fleet uh, aircraft in the fleet. So this is a big uh, investment for us. It's, uh, How much? What was the bill for all of that? List price, uh, 20 something billion uh, dollars. 20 billion? And we get, uh, usually get... And the, what, uh, what's discounts. the turnover of your business at the moment? Uh, 2.5 billion. I mean, and your shareholders are absolutely... They're very happy. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's obvious you're an airline, you need aircraft. Uh, true, but uh, you've also got to service a massive amount of debt. Uh, yeah, but uh, not yet. So as you, as you go along, you take deliveries of these aircraft, you, know, you secure your production capacity with the most efficient aircraft. Uh, you're pretty good, uh, good, good to go. Well, what is the time frame for the rollout of this purchase? I mean, how, uh, Last one will be delivered uh, 2022. So it's a 10-year program, basically. I mean, I, I, this is for you or indeed anybody else. Is this the biggest sort of European uh, yeah, new aircraft the biggest, purchase ever? I, mean, I think it's the biggest in Europe uh, at the time. Blimey. Um, and you're absolutely confident this, is, this, this, this makes sense. You, you, I mean, you're the chief financial officer, mm -hmm. so I guess you're the right guy to ask. Yeah, it will be tough, <laughs> it will be tough to say no. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, uh, we did a long study on that, and uh, uh, we definitely think it's a good, uh, right. good uh, decision. And, 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 and you're securing your production capacity forever with the most efficient production capacity there is. Um, how does this, uh, forgive my ignorance, but I didn't quite understand what some of those aircraft models were because I'm not mm -hmm. in this business, but are, are some of those aircraft going to be flying transatlantic? Well, some of these aircraft have the capacity of, of doing so if you position them, uh, uh, depending upon where you position them. Uh, but it's the, the single aisle uh, Boeing 737 uh, aircraft, typically 190, 89 uh, seats. Uh, with, uh, tremendous efficiency improvements and they can reach uh, quite many new destinations. But I, I just want to now get to grips with your transatlantic ambitions because mm -hmm. again on the panel we've heard lots of uh, debate and, and quite a lot of skepticism about um, yeah. you know, low cost uh, being applied to long haul. 
Um, so just explain to me how you're going to do it. Okay, so the, the long haul operation, it uh, comes on top of uh, what we discussed uh, already. We have uh, today an order of eight, seven, eight, seven Dreamliners from Boeing. Uh, operation started in uh, July, June, July this year. So you've got these 787s or you're getting them? We have gotten two of them. Okay. The third one is coming in uh, November, fourth in February. So we basically have a eight aircraft, uh, uh, eight aircraft fleet of uh, long haul uh, uh, machines, mm. and uh, which been touched on today uh, a lot on on, uh, on that. But uh, for us, it's uh, starting long haul is all about having the right cost associated with your uh, aircraft and the operations of the aircraft. Uh, we saw that only in the Dreamliner when we did a feasibility study way back. Uh, potentially also in the Airbus 350. Uh, secondly, you need uh, uh, the right labor cost uh, when you pursue uh, that strategy, how we see it. And by uh, getting both a uh, Dreamliner as the airline uh, with the great savings on, on uh, fuel, on maintenance, as well as uh, the right or the lowest or the appropriate uh, labor cost at your crew, uh, we saw great cost benefits compared to what the industry uh, ordered to have on the cost, uh, cost of uh, long-haul operation. And yes, uh, with that uh, in the thinking, we saw a potential on moving long-haul efficiently and with an advantage on, on cost to basically every other long-haul operator, operator without uh, the Dreamliner or uh, the lowest could you get I think Michael's making a phone call just to check out your purchasing plan because did you get a deal on dreamliners that was that, that Michael because I mean, Michael was saying he couldn't buy planes to do transatlantic at a price that made it possible and you're saying you've just bought these planes and you're the CFO and you say it's more than possible well it's it's uh, only eight aircraft uh, so far it's three three we purchased uh, five released. But I guess uh, I would agree with the, uh, the point uh, Michael is making, that if you can get aircraft even cheaper than that or anywhere else, you get a cost advantage. Of course. So yes, of course. Wait for a downturn and think you can buy cheaper aircraft. If you do, you get an advantage, obviously. Now he so far, we don't think that's possible. Right. He said, uh, obviously it's very easy to say when it's all hypothetical, but he said if he were running a, a transatlantic operation, he'd be offering a sort of headline <coughs> Uh, attention-grabbing $10 fare to draw people in. What, yeah. what, what's your fare structure like for transatlantic? Is it yeah, well, how low cost is it? Well, again, I guess it's all, all uh, relative. Uh, we introduced uh, $150 uh, introductionary price converted from from, from one, one way. One way, $150, and we thought that was uh, extraordinarily cheap. Yeah. Of course, it's not going to be all the tickets uh, at, at uh, that price, but uh, it's all relative again. Yeah, that's fairly cheap. I think uh, going forward, you have a, a huge fleet of, of Dreamliners or long-haul aircraft. It's up and going. You can introduce even even lower fares, obviously. We have uh, empty seats uh, when we fly today. Not many, though. Well, I mean, I'd, you know, I'd have to say $150. That's all in taxes, everything. 150 bucks. Yeah. So that's like uh, 100 quid. Yep. Uh, 100 English pounds to to New York. Where is it? To New York? Or, no, it's not to New York. Is it's it? uh, Oslo or the Scandinavian uh, uh, capitals to, to New York oh, and to Bangkok. Right. And, uh, I mean, are you looking to maintain that sort? I mean, that that that's difficult to better, frankly, out of the UK. So, are you looking? perhaps to get custom where they'll fly a low-cost airline into Scandinavia and then jump onto your plane across the Atlantic. Is that what you want to do? I think uh, both yes, uh, yes and no. And, and yes in a way that uh, today we have uh, about 18, 19 million people traveling around in our short-haul network. Of course we'd like to see those uh, passengers jumping onto our long-haul fleet. So yes. But uh, then again, strategically, we're setting up point-to-point -point, uh, routes to attract volume on that point-to-point -point destination. So, uh, but uh, obviously we have a, a, a great operation, short haul operation already, and that so those passengers will be feeded into into the network. And, and you've got all these planes that you've got to fill, mm -hmm. obviously, to pay for them. Uh, where are your Where are you looking in Europe for your big expansion in in routes and activity? Well, today, 
so far, uh, and obviously we've been growing out of Norway, the Scandinavian countries, then Nordics uh, with Finland. And uh, there's still a great opportunity to grow volume uh, and also take market share in that, that region for, uh, for many, many years to come. Uh, recently we set up a base uh, in, uh, at Gatwick, uh, basically to serve all the Scandinavian traffic we already have to, to London. Mm -hmm. Now it's a base there serving it uh, the other way. Uh, we also launched uh, a few bases in Spain, uh, basically to do the same. And uh, slowly now uh, exploring flying uh, uh, London, Spain, into other places in, in, in Europe. I was going to say, do you see yourselves becoming more and more a, a real competitor for Ryanair and EasyJet, leaving aside Scandinavia, but flying point to point within, uh, within other parts of Europe? Yeah, that's uh, definitely... Uh, uh, you will see that, uh, or, or how we see it, it it's, uh, as we grow now into, uh, into, into Europe, uh, we get closer to EasyJet, uh, Vueling, uh, Ryanair. Do you think you'll change your name? To what? Something that doesn't suggest that you're flying to Norway or that you've got something. I mean, Norway is very <laughs> associated with very high costs. And also, you know, it's not a natural thing to do, is it? To book a flight from London to Malaga on Norwegian air shuttle. I mean, just... Yeah, so what, are, what would be a normal then? Well, you just find a name that's completely neutral and suggests you're cheap as opposed to Scandinavian expensive. Well, I think you know, Norwegian is a good uh, quality, uh, has a good quality uh, association, uh, association with it. And so far it worked uh, great out of uh, Gatwick, uh, out of Spain. Uh, we have a high, very high share of, uh, yeah. uh, of traffic the, the other way. And uh, no, we're not going to change that. Uh, and if I, is it true that you have established a sort of notional headquarters in Ireland so that you can escape from Norwegian uh, very strict regulations on hiring non-EU staff? Yeah, I, I guess that's... Uh, uh, we're registering uh, uh, aircraft in Ireland, AOC in Ireland, and it's not to escape, uh, escape a Norwegian government, it's more to adapt to the politics, the rules and regulations they have in, in Norway. And um, again, when so, so just explain. The, just to escape. Uh, <laughs> explain how that isn't basically escaping the very strict rules on, for example, the hiring of cabin crew. You, the yeah. truth is that you couldn't hire the cabin crew you wanted from Asia, who presumably yeah. you don't pay as much as the Norwegians would like you to pay. Uh, so that's why you created this sort of notional base in Ireland, right? Am I missing something? No, you're not, not missing it. It's uh, adapting to politics and uh, <laughs> adapting to, to, to the marketplace. No, it's, uh, yeah, it's difficult. It's, uh, some things are difficult. Uh, and again, uh, aircraft is important. Labor cost is important to compete. And uh, we cannot go out there with Scandinavian labor cost competing with uh, with. Uh, Asian crew cost or, or American crew cost. Which brings me back to my point about, you know, whether you change your name. I mean, you, you, as your company grows and you've got massively ambitious plans, you are going to disconnect more and more for, from Scandinavia, aren't you? We'll be growing internationally and uh, the Norwegian platform uh, will be relatively small compared to the rest of the rest of the operation. But uh, if you're going to change uh, Norwegian, uh, would you change Air France? Would you change British Airways name? Because uh, it doesn't work internationally, I don't think so. I think it's a good, a very good name. Okay, well, Frodo, thank, thank you very much indeed. Let's just see. Is there anybody who? Will, well, I tell you what. As we've got the whole panel here now, we we will just open it up for a free for all, really. Um,